Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, producer and host. First up on this episode, we'll be taking a look at the thought and legacy of John Maynard Keynes, the 20th century British economist. Known as the founding father of macroeconomics, Keynes's thought changed the way we approach economics, for better or for worse. So how did his economic thought become so dominant, and where has it left us? Victor Klar, professor of economics at Florida Gulf Coast University, breaks it down. Then on the second segment, I'll be bringing you an interview that we ran on the podcast about a year ago now. Since this podcast has grown so much in just the past year, I thought it would be good to revisit who Lord Acton is. He's, of course, the namesake of the Acton Institute, and he's known most for his quote about power, that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. In this conversation, Acton's Dan Huger joins me to break down the life and thought of Acton. As always, you can check out our resources and articles for this episode in our show notes. And those are posted at blog.acton.org. That's blog.acton, A-C-T-O-N dot O-R-G. Today, I am talking to Victor Klar. He is the professor of economics at Florida Gulf Coast University, and today he is speaking with me about what he calls the moral legacy of Keynes. Uh, Victor, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Great to be here, Caroline. So first, of course, we are going to start off with the most basic question. Who was John Maynard Keynes? John Maynard Keynes is known by most economists as the father of modern macroeconomics. And it really wasn't until his most famous book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, it wasn't until that book was published in 1936 that we had anything in economics that resembled what today we would refer to as macroeconomics. Now, don't get me wrong, before Keynes came along, we kept track of macro-level data for different economies, including the British economy, but in terms of trying to model the economy, and treat it like it's one big machine and a one big machine that we have the power to manage, that really was new with Keynes. And so it wasn't until Keynes came along and then his acolytes, his successors came along after him that we developed two courses that you take an introductory economics in college, both microeconomics, and then the one we have Keynes to thank for macroeconomics. So what was it about Keynes or his background that made him look at economics differently compared to economists before him? So we often think of economists as being fairly nerdy. They have thick-rimmed glasses. In fact, there's a famous New Yorker cartoon where a Manhattan socialite is hosting a party, and she escorts a slender gentleman in a skinny necktie and a sport coat and thick-rimmed glasses over to one of her guests who's seated on the couch. And the socialite hostess says, Jane, I'd like you to meet David. David's an economist, but he's really very interesting. And so we economists were always trying to overcome this stereotype that we're somewhat dull, we set our watches by the atomic clock, and we sit in our offices for hours and look at the data. Keynes really defied that stereotype. He moved among British socialites. He was married to a famous ballerina, Lydia Lopakova, and he had become a celebrity in the United Kingdom because of a book he wrote, Economic Consequences of the Peace, that talked about the peace discussions following World War I. And the book became a sensation, not only because of the fairly gossip column-like things that he told about famous heads of state in that book, he also predicted something like the economic collapse of Germany in that same book. So by the time his general theory rolled around in 1936, Keynes not only was a celebrity, not only was he a a flamboyant scholar in the British landscape, he also seemed remarkably prescient. You mentioned this group of socialites that he ran around with in London. Is that the Bloomsbury group? Yeah, that's right. Now, who were they exactly? How did they have an impact on his economic thought? Yeah, so throughout economic history, Human beings have always studied economics with an overlay of some sort of teleology. Now, for people like Aristotle, or what in the book we call the naturalist paradigm, they basically thought that there was order to the world, 
And our job as human beings in the world is to figure out how the order is organized and then use that ordering to pursue virtuous outcomes and live a good life. And then when the period of the church came along, then the church understood that, oh, these rules that seem to govern the universe, they have a source. And the source is a master de designer creator. And so when economists like Aquinas studied the economic order, they weren't just studying it to understand it better like people like Aristotle had been. They now had a truly noble calling because they wanted to understand how the world worked. They wanted to understand it better because God had made it. And they felt like when they understood the created order better, they would understand the creator himself better. And they also believed based on scripture that our purpose here isn't random or arbitrary. Our purpose is to take God's creative order and created order and extend it through our own creative acts. So whether in the natural paradigm or in the church paradigm, human beings had a purpose and there was an order to the universe and we were supposed to play a part in it. And even when the enlightenment came along, it didn't do away with entirely some well-shared common conceptions of what a human being was for or what we were called to do. We just now had a richer understanding of how powerful a tool reason could be in sorting these things out. But you're exactly right, Caroline. Keynes moved in some circles that wanted to not only challenge existing transcendent concepts. Keynes and his friends in the Blueberry, Bloomsbury group, they wanted to do away with all sorts of traditions entirely because they thought that human beings were shackled by these arbitrary whims of morality that weren't really grounded in anything. And if only we could overcome the weights of morality that weighed us down, we could become truly flourishing human beings, but we had to cast off existing morality and pursue, pursue flourishing as we ourselves saw it. So would you say that Keynes' system of economics was much more grounded in uh, more materialism or consumerism and as a result, more kind of utilitarian? I think that's exactly right. Um, John Stuart Mill, a predecessor of Keynes, is famous for lots and lots of things, both in economics and outside. And one of the things he's most famous for within economics is his concept of economic man, or the economists will joke that we're homo economicus. Um, don't get me wrong, homo economicus, economic man is a caricature that Mill came up with. And the caricature is that we try to work to, in order to earn a living. We prefer leisure to labor if it's possible. But even Mill in this caricature understood that it really was in fact a caricature. Keynes came along and he turned Mill's caricature Mill's Pinocchio, if you will, of what a human being is like, and said that, nope, that's exactly what a human being is going to be, and that's all that a human being should be. So Keynes' focus was on ma the material, what can be consumed, what pleasure is like, in whatever sense pleasure is valuable to you, and he transformed the caricature of economic man that is a useful apparatus and we use it today in really valuable ways. But he narrowed the focus of economics to only those things and forgot about human anthropology. He forgot about these traditional paradigms in which human history has been worked out. And in fact, he had a distaste for them because he thought they got in the way of clear-headed thinking about what society should pursue, who should be in charge, and what the ends ultimately should be. Now, I think a lot of people out there will be familiar with the phrase, we are all Keynesians now, uh, coined by Milton Friedman and attributed to Richard Nixon. Uh, when that was said, what what did exactly did he mean by that? It, did he just mean that Keynesian economics was now the dominant thought in economics? And if so, how, how did it become so dominant? The key focal point here is that Keynes really has won the day in terms of how we do economics now. So Keynes was very successful in getting all of the economists, the free market minded ones and the not so free market minded ones 
to focus on the outcomes that Keynes cared about, and they were things that were convenient to measure and quantify like GDP, inflation rates, unemployment rates. People like Milton Friedman, who was infamously or famously quoted, depending on your perspective, as saying, we're all Keynesians now, what he meant by that was not that, oh, Keynes is exactly right. He didn't mean that Keynes is right, we should manipulate the economy using a mix of carefully timed fiscal and monetary policies. What Friedman meant when he said we're all Keynesians now is that all of economics has been taken over by the Keynesian view of things, the Keynesian methods of modeling things in economics. And if you want to be taken seriously in the 1960s as an economist, you have to sound like a Keynesian and use Keynesian mathematical tools, even if you think Keynes is wrong in terms of what we should be doing with either fiscal policy or monetary policy. So Friedman really was a free market Chicago style economist who was dressed in Keynesian clothing because he knew nobody would take him seriously at academic meetings if he didn't have sophisticated models of his own. But Friedman creatively and skillfully used those mathematical models to make more free market arguments than the ones, of course, that Keynes had been making. So what tangibly around us can we look at that we say, well, that is in economics a result of Keynes? What can you point to? I think our economic prosperity that we enjoy in 2019, which is combined with many concerns, that if you play fair, and do the right things and honor the rules, you're going to get the shaft. I think people are frustrated because they do have material prosperity, but they do feel like something is missing. And I think one of the ways that Keynes affected not only the discipline of economics, but broader society, is he was able to, through economists like John Kenneth Galbraith and Paul Samuelson and Milton Friedman, who we already mentioned, because those are the economists that Americans were paying attention to throughout the 60s and the 70s and the 1980s. Well, you read enough columns in Newsweek written by people like Milton Friedman and Paul Samuelson debating whether or not Keynes is right or Keynes is wrong. You also, even though you're not an economist, you start to see the world and your place in it framed in a very Keynesian way, focused on income, saving, the balance in your 401k retirement fund. And don't get me wrong, being a good steward of things is very, very important, and we're called to do it. But we've lost track of what our shared values are in the United States in 2019. And honestly, I think that's one of the reasons that the progressives and the conservatives disagree so much and so strongly over economic policy today, it's because they don't have a shared understanding of basic first principles of human anthropology. Now, I know and you know that we do have some shared first principles among us, no, no matter how rancorous the debate is between, say, Bernie bros and libertarians. If you went out on the street corner outside Madcap in Grand Rapids, and you interviewed 100 people and you asked them one question, do you think that a human being possesses intrinsic human dignity? You would probably get a 100% affirmative response. But because we don't have fundamental core conversations like that, and we focus instead on what we should be doing, but not the why of what we should, what, uh, not the why of what we're doing or why we should be doing it, then we end up fighting a lot because we don't have a shared vision of what society is for, what the culture is for, and what each one of us is for. So practically, how do we build those larger fundamental conversations? What exactly would you like to see from economists? I think the most important thing that needs to happen right now is economists need to confess that they don't have it all figured out. They need to confess that there are human beings behind the quantified mathematical models that they use. Now, again, don't get me wrong. I love economics, and these mathematical modeling tools that we use are very helpful and very useful. And I'm not saying that we need to do away with them. What I am saying is that economists need to be more honest about what they know and what they don't know. And they need to confess that beneath the surface, there is always 
a normative texture. There's always a normative landscape behind all of these models. And to act like they're entirely amoral, I think is unfair and dishonest on the part of economists. So economists should remind each other and remind the people who are interested in economics, and even further, the people who are living out economic lives every day, who feel disconnected from their work. They feel like they're individuals that are part of a much larger machine they call the economy. And if we could see ourselves as people who work in the world in the service of others, that that work has value, that even when we have a bad day at work, somebody else is there on the other side of the market who's really thankful that we were there that day. And if we can, whether we're progressives, conservatives, libertarians, if we can have an even richer conversation about what our shared understandings are. Now, it's 2019, and there's a lot of diversity out there, and there doesn't need to be groupthink in 2019. What we need to do is have conversations in all of our different faith traditions and all of our different secular traditions and identify a handful of things about which there's shared agreement in terms of human purpose. And once we do that, then we can begin to take some steps forward that consider carefully whether a given policy really takes us in a direction that we desire to go or whether we've just been pursuing that policy because that's always what our tr particular tribe has been doing and we're sticking to it no matter what. Victor, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks so much, Caroline. If you're liking this podcast, I wanted to take a moment to ask you to do a quick favor for our podcast team here and leave us a rating on the Apple Podcast app. As this podcast gets more ratings, it helps bring the podcast more attention. I check out all the ratings and reviews that you leave because I want to make sure that you're liking what we produce for you. It helps me figure out what you like and what you want to hear more of. And if you want to contact me to let me know what you think of the podcast, you can email me at actinline at actin.org. Your feedback matters to me, so please don't hesitate to reach out. Now back to the show. Today, I have the pleasure of sitting down with Dan Huger, Research Associate and Librarian here at Acton. Dan, thank you for joining me on the show. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Caroline. Surprisingly, we've actually never talked about Lord Acton on the Acton Institute's podcast. I wouldn't know who Lord Acton was if I hadn't become familiarized with the Acton Institute a couple years ago, first when um, I was in college, and then as an intern, I heard you speak on Lord Acton's life a few times. But if it wasn't for that, I would have absolutely no idea who Acton is. And I think it's pretty important that we emphasize who Acton was on the podcast. So we're going to start out with the most basic question. Who was Lord Acton? Well, Lord Acton is uh, an English Catholic historian, is briefly a politician and also a journalist um, who helped sort of introduce a lot of the uh, German methods of historiography into England and was also... Um, sort of a leading Catholic intellectual at a time when England was, for the first time since the Reformation, sort of opening up and allowing Catholic political participation uh, once more. I'm also curious, before we continue in our conversation, how did you first become interested in Lord Acton? Because he's a bit of a obscure historical figure and not many people know who he is, although many people would know his most famous quote, which is power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I mean, there are so many people I know who do know that statement from him, whether it's from a certain Star Trek episode or any movie kind of dealing with themes of totalitarianism. So how, how did you first learn who Lord Acton was and why are you still so interested in who he is? Yeah, I first learned who Lord Acton was... Um when I was getting my, my history degree at Hillsdale and we were doing sort of like a history of, of his historiography and Acton came up there very briefly. When I was hired by the Acton Institute originally, I went and I had a conversation with my father and I was telling him about, you know, this exciting job opportunity. And he uh, asked if we worked with Broadway Grand Rapids 
And I was, I just paused for a minute and I go, no, 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 the Acton Institute, not the Acton Institute. Not acting, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And at that time he asked me, well, you know, who is, who is Lord Acton? And I said, well, you know, he's a 19th century English historian. And that was, that was basically it. Like I had very little grounding in sort of who Lord Acton was. And as I became, you know, working day to day in the Acton Institute and going through the archives. Um, originally, Acton was very much front and center. We used to have an annual uh, every year on Lord Acton's birthday. We would have a Lord Acton dinner and a lecture um, about Lord on Lord Acton from various different uh, Lord Acton scholars. And one of our first books was actually a. Uh, a short collection called that we called the History of Liberty, which included Acton speeches, uh, lectures, um, the history of freedom in antiquity, and the history of freedom in Christianity, and an introduction by Jim Holland, who was a, a Lord Acton scholar who did a lot of fabulous work throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s on Lord Acton, and who was uh, early involved uh, with the Acton Institute. Um, and I started, you know, tracing these lectures out. I read uh, Gertrude Himmelfarb has a fabulous biography that we've brought back into print um, called Lord Acton, A Study in Conscience and Politics. And then uh, several years ago, I realized that there wasn't a contemporary single volume anthology of Lord Acton out. And we, uh, I then uh, put together a book called uh, Lord Acton, Historical and Moral Essays that would kind of introduce the reader to sort of Lord Acton's thoughts on morality history and gives a sort of like outline of his incomplete his incomplete history of liberty and then while we were doing that and I was going through the sources uh Sam Gregg put together a nice companion volume uh called Lord Acton Historian and Moralist that goes through and a lot of those early Acton Institute Lord Acton lectures are in there, as well as some more recent German historiography on Lord Acton that's recently Mm. been translated. So as I was doing some research on Acton earlier today, I learned that he had a library of about 67,000 volumes. His notes and manuscripts in the Cambridge Library fill some 50,000 pages, and he also produced 200 definitions of liberty. He was also once called the most learned Englishman alive, but he never published a book. Why is that? One of... um Acton's great teachers, uh, Ignaz von Dollinger, said very prophetically that if Acton didn't finish a major book by the time he was 30, he would never publish a book at all. And what we have that survives are long essays that he wrote during his journalistic career for various publications, also lectures that he delivered throughout his life on historical questions. There's a ton of written material But nothing ever sort of formally organized into a book. And part of this is, you know, responsibilities throughout his life are sort of divided between a political career that his stepfather really wanted for him, um, that Acton, Acton wasn't very much interested in, but dutifully because he believed in sort of, um, the principles of the then English Liberal Party felt obligated to sort of give it a go anyways. And then, when he became involved with journals of opinion and sort of controversies, that kept him from formalizing, you know, any grand academic volume. And then later in life, he becomes sort of a general advisor to <clears throat> William Gladstone, the great 19th century liberal prime minister of England, and becomes involved a lot there. And so it's only very late in life that he gets appointed to a university position at Cambridge. During that time, he conceives of uh, the Cambridge Modern History, which is going to be this multi-volume set that he is going to contribute some small parts to. But then he also was trying to line up leading scholars of the day who had specialties in various um, aspects of modern history and try to do a definitive history that was going to encompass a lot of his ideas um, that he knew he didn't have the time to get out at this point in his life by himself. You know, unfortunately, he passes away before the completion of that. So when you say definitive history, Mm -hmm. how far did this go back? This went back. Lord Acton had planned to write the first essay, which he ended up 
passing away before he could, which was basically sort of an essay on the medieval period and its relation to the modern world. And then this would begin, the history proper itself would begin in sort of early modern Europe and would go forward from there. And that was, you know, a very grand project, was eventually completed as a multi-volume project, and Cambridge is, in fact, uh, done a successor series um, later in the 20th century, sort of trying to update it. Sort of the scope of the project, when Acton thought about history, he thought about it in terms of ideas, in tracing these ideas throughout history. He thought ideas are sort of the motive force for people's actions. And when you do that, when your historical questions are grand like that, like the history of liberty, there's no end to it. When your subject is an idea through throughout all of history, that's very, very difficult to do. And this is where court, sort of the library comes from as well, because the whole time he's going throughout Europe, he's going through all of these archives that are opening up in Paris, in Rome. He's digging through these papers. He's taking these copious notes on index cards, you know, thousands and thousands of index cards, some of which, you know, there's no attribution for where the quote came from. So it's kind of difficult to tell, you know, was this Acton's original idea? Was this something he copied out of a book but just didn't note it? And the library becomes so big and so expansive that eventually he has to sell it. He sells it to a friend who then donates it to Cambridge, which is how all of this winds up in Cambridge. And Acton kept the books throughout his life. Even the, the, the terms of the sale were that when he passed on, this library would then leave his possession and come into Cambridge. So that library and those notes and those hundreds of definitions of various ideas throughout history all come through this sort of lifelong research project that he was never able to wrap up in any sort of definitive fashion. But at the same time, he leaves, he leaves us a lot of essays that give us a really good picture of where he was going with it. Not as fleshed out as he would like, but, you know, he's sort of a perfectionist by nature, I think. So what was Acton's early life like? What would have molded him into the kind of person that ended up having that sort of mind and drive for history and watching how liberty and ideas and totalitarianism all unfolded throughout history? What projected him along that career? Part of it is Acton is actually born in Naples and winds up actually having to be made a citizen by an act of parliament because... Both his father and his grandfather were also born in Naples. The reason for this sort of convoluted family history is that opportunities for Catholics in England before, you know, the middle of the 19th century were very, very restricted. Acton's family had been Catholic for generations. As a result, his great-grandfather had gone to Naples to serve in the Navy, um, his grandfather was the prime minister of Naples. After It wasn't until after Lord Acton's father had passed away that his mother then moved back to England with him. So he has this, and he has relations also in France, in Germany, sort of all over. There is this extended Catholic family across the continent. As a result, Acton grows up speaking a lot of languages, which is an excellent tool for a historian to have. He also grows up as a Catholic in England at the time as a minority, and a minority in which there's, there's a lot of animus directed at English Catholics. Acton at the same time falls in love with history early on, and he starts reading a lot of the uh, English Whig historians of the period. And there is very much a preoccupation with England as the center of the world and the center of the development of freedom, democracy, of the economy. Acton is intrigued by that. Later, he sort of distanced himself from some of the more naive aspects of that historiography. But he thinks, I think, about liberty and becomes preoccupied with liberty as both an interesting historical question, one that fits with his own political commitments, but also as a way to sort of link himself, link the earlier medieval tradition, and link the Catholic Church with this legacy in England, and to posit that in a, in a medieval England, in a Catholic England. And this is a way 
that I think he can conceive of himself as an authentic English person and as a way that English Catholics can take a hold of that English legacy of freedom and constitutional government that in many ways they felt alienated from prior to that. Now, I'm going to veer off in a slightly different direction now because I want to talk about how his work and the way that he analyzed history along the lines of what you were talking about and that ideas have consequences. And he recognized Mm -hmm. this, especially um, how that is central to the Acton Institute and what we do. Mm -hmm. Because I think the Acton Institute, we're special in our mission in that we combine Judeo-Christian principles with economics and try to point out how a free market economy and human flourishing are really supported by these religious principles. So considering that, what did Acton specifically have to say on this subject? How did he see religion being central to a conversation on things related to history, uh, liberty, how these played out. There's a great uh, lecture of Lord Acton's, the, uh, the History of Freedom and Antiquity, that gets to a lot of these questions. He talks about how the concept of law as being something that is not, uh, that is above all men, uh, in a similar way that God is above all men. And he sees this idea developing from the ancient Hebrews and the notions of the Ten Commandments of a law delivered by God that men are to live under and to live equally under. He posits a sort of separation of church and state and an understanding of the limits of state power to Christ in the New Testament, talking about rendering things unto Caesar that are Caesar's and unto God that are God's. He views this as very different from an earlier pagan tradition, which often sees religion and the state as combined, as the sort of, you know, the sort of God emperors, the Pharaoh, this sort of earlier tradition in the West. He even comments um, in a curious part, and he doesn't go into this a whole lot, about how perhaps the the first free society is that of... uh, King Ashoka in India, the first Buddhist king of India. So he clearly sees religion as integral to the forming of a free society. And when Acton talks about a free society, he's talking about things like rule of law, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion. He is also a proponent of free trade and a lot of those things. But Acton's primarily concerned with the sort of uh, political liberty and doesn't write extensively on uh, on questions of economic liberty. So I, I know that you have a page of quotes there in front mm-hmm. of you. What are some of your favorite Acton quotes and why? So one of the most, most interesting things about Lord Acton is how he defines liberty and the role of conscience in that, which gets to a lot of these, you know, where does religion inform? Where does the nature of the human person inform what we do? In the History of Freedom and Antiquity, he he writes, uh, by liberty, I mean the assurance that every man shall be protected in doing what he believes is his duty against the influence of authority and majorities, customs, and opinion. So this is a pretty standard sort of definition of liberty. But Acton does sort of nuance this and contextualize this, like from uh, uh, his essay on the Roman question. There is a wide divergence and irreconcilable disagreement between the political notions of the modern world and that which is essentially the system of the Catholic Church. It manifests itself particularly in the contradictory views of liberty and of the functions of the civil power. The Catholic notion, defining liberty not as the power of doing what we like, but the right of being able to do what we ought, denies the general interests can supersede individual rights. It condemns, therefore, the theory of the ancient as well as the modern state. So this collapse in the ancient world between any sort of divisions of church and state, of any divisions between the authority of God and the authority of the king, is something that is antithetical to Acton's view of freedom. At the same time, that freedom is not wholly unbounded. It is accountable to God, um, and it is accountable to our own conscience. And he writes, this is in a sort of manuscript fragment. This is one of those index cards that I was talking about earlier. He says, uh, our conscience exists and acts for ourselves. It exists in each of us. It is limited by the conscience of others. It is enough for oneself, not for another. It respects the conscience of others. Therefore, it tends to restrict authority and enlarge liberty. It is the law of self-government. So for Acton, you know, freedom is not a mere 
sort of license. It is the condition that's necessary for you to embrace your freely chosen duty, those duties to God and conscience. Um, It's the necessary condition for living a moral life, living in the world, respecting uh, neighbors and honoring God. Yep. Well, that that brings to mind the idea of oughtness. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if it was Acton or not who said this, but that freedom is having the liberty to do what we ought. Mm -hmm. Was that Acton who said that? It is Acton. That is, the quote appears in secondary literature Mm -hmm. all the time. In various (laughs) ways, all of the time. And I think it comes from that segment of the Roman question that I quoted earlier, which is which is not quite the same. It's not quite as pithy as as uh, the other arrangements come. But that notion that defining liberty not as the power of doing what we like, but the right of being able to do what we ought. That clause in that sentence of the Roman question, um, I think, is where that comes from. Well, Dan, thank you so much for sitting down with me today and going over this. I hope to parse out a little bit more of Acton as we move on the podcast for this next coming year. And there is so much to touch on regarding Acton, and it is impossible to do him justice in a segment that is under 30 minutes. But thank you anyway for trying with me today, and I look forward to speaking about Acton with you more. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. And I am I am always I count it a privilege to be able to talk about Lord Acton. Thank you for listening today. To learn more about the Acton Institute and what we do, visit our website at acton.org. This episode of Acton Line was produced and edited by me, Caroline Roberts, with audio mixing by Doug Nagel.